you shine the light on what people should know and and why the, they deserve better, why the world should be different. And by doing so, you automatically raise your own profile, which is counterintuitive, but it's very reassuring for people to go, oh my God, like it doesn't have to be about me. Mark, good to see and hear you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me. I um, thought it'd be good to start um, with just a bit about you before we before we dive into to what we're going to talk about today around storytelling. Yeah, I, I, so um, glad to be here. It's good it's good to see you again um, in in a virtual context, but we actually have had the pleasure of meeting in person, I believe. So yeah. <laughs> so we can we can actually have that. But yeah, so my name is Mark Larousse. It's it's semi unpronounceable because my dad's French and my my mum's British. So I was born and raised in a dual heritage household. Um, but I'm, a, I'm an award-winning podcast host, a best-selling author, and a sought-after speaker at um, conferences and, and Fortune 500 companies. And I'm on a mission to help entrepreneurs and business leaders impact the world with their story. So I just wrote a new book called Own Your Story, Why Sharing Your Personal Story Can Transform Your Business and Change Your Life. That came out with Hachette UK. And really, I'm trying to spread the message and the word to let everybody know just how powerful the story was. I keep on saying that. If you knew how powerful your story was, you wouldn't be sitting on it. Awesome. Yeah. So it would be good to dive into to the book a bit because obviously it talks about the power of storytelling. Mm. And for to, to help the audience, it would be good to kind of tie that in with how it can, can help your business and your brand. But I think a lot of people struggle with telling stories in general, but telling mm. their story. And, and we'll probably touch on imposter syndrome a little bit because it's bound, it's bound to come up with this sort of thing. But yeah, yeah can, you, can you tell us maybe a bit about the power of storytelling and, um, and, and maybe a bit about why you, what drove you to write this book as well? Why this, why this yeah. subject? So I'll try and unpack that and, and, and let me know if I go off of a ta- on a tangent, which I tend to do. But so, you know, which ties a little bit more about my background, I guess, in a way. So I, I grew up as I said, in this kind of dual heritage household where, you know, we had family in the UK and, and family in France and we'd traveled between these two kind of countries and, and, and I'd hear stories, right, from my grandpas. And I've always been fascinated since I was a kid to sit around and listen to adults, I guess, share stories, right? And particularly my French grandparents who had lived through the Second World War and my great-grandfather was kind of like a war hero who received one of the highest recognitions from as a civilian um from the president Charles de Gaulle at the time called La Légion d'honneur and uh he was a bit of a legend in kind of like Corrèze where he was from the people coming at least that's how my grandmother portrayed him but so she would tell stories about him and and stories about kind of trying to derailing trains and you know Nazi Germany and 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 kind of rescuing people and hiding them and part, like it was all like these fascinating stories and they got so my grandfather got caught at Dunkirk and my grandmother was tortured and my great grandfather ended up being captured and sent to, to, to camps in, 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 in Germany as well. And so, but you'd hear these stories, right? Of like these anecdotes. And I just remember being fascinated by them. And one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't capture those stories. Like it's really a, a, a big regret of mine because as time goes by, I'm forgetting more and more the voice of my grandmother. Some of the stories become a bit hazy. So I was always just fascinated by that. And then I had a one of my first jobs out, out of university, um, I, I was in, in corporate media sales. It's kind of advertorials for anybody who might be aware of that space. It's kind of like paid ads, but you also put text boxes. So if you open up a newspaper, let's say the Wall Street Journal, the Sunday Telegraph or whatever, you might have a, a country report on an emerging economy that might have a bit of a bad rep in the news, but you kind of portray them as this amazing kind of nation and and like a beacon of hope of of, of whatever area they're in. And um, I used to do that. And part of that was interviewing a lot of government officials. So from all the way to the presidents, to ministers and CEOs and chairmen of companies and so forth. And I was there to sell ads, but I didn't really care about selling ads. I was really interested in hearing about the stories. So I would hear these incredible stories and journeys of women and men who'd achieved this kind of impressive success, whether that was in um, you know politics or in, or in business or both sometimes. And and I'd ask them stories. Like I remember particularly in South Africa, I was in South Africa and, you know, the apartheid and the end apartheid wasn't that long ago, like when you think about it. 
And so I would ask, you know, taxi drivers or CEO of the free trade agreement zone in, in Durban, like, what was it like, you know, during the apartheid to live and, and, and what helped you remain a sense of pride of being black when you were being told constantly of less of a human you were and like just these stories were just fascinating to me. And I think when, you know, I, I kind of changed jobs and I kept on like stories, part of everything we do, right? Like I, whether you see it or know it or want to believe it or not, like everything we do in life is about story. The stories we tell ourselves, the story we tell about the world, the stories we tell the world, the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we eat, like everything is just like you're communicating something, right? It's a story in itself. And so I was always fascinated by that world. And I, I joined a business school uh, in Seattle where I was working with some like of the top business professors in the world, learning from them and, and learning things like social entrepreneurship, which, you know, I was blown away that you could use business principles to foster social transformation. And I was just, again, it was like, how do you communicate a message in a powerful way that that sticks, that people remember and want to share with others on your behalf. Like, I was just fascinated. How do you do that? And then I joined the November Foundation as employee number three of Team Europe, and I became country manager there, where I launched and, and grew the foundation across European countries, including France. And the team and I managed to raise 2.8 million euros for men's health. We got 110,000 people to sign up, and we won a bunch of, and I won a bunch of awards along the way. But the reason why I say that is all I had was like, a really questionable moustache, a backpack, and a powerful story. I would just share the story of November of like why the founders started it, you know, why there are just as many of prostate cancer patients that there are breast cancer, but you know, people. So there was just like this raising awareness wrapped up in a story. And I was, and I just, I was good at it and I loved it, right? I would go around and I would just talk to anybody who would listen to me to hear the story. And, and I saw the power that having a really compelling origin story had on galvanizing interest and, and connecting with an audience. And I, I was curious to see, like, is this only for charities, but or can businesses do that too? Can business leaders and businesses actually do the same? And so I, I, I launched a podcast in 2015 called The Unconventionalists. And the idea was to kind of capture the stories of unconventional business leaders and entrepreneurs and, and game changers who were doing some really exciting things in, in business and in politics and, in, in, you know, authors and athletes and TV performers and all that kind of stuff to distill their stories of the ups and downs and the lessons learned from both. And what was amazing to me were two things. I had this weird kind of ringside seat where on, on, on one side, I was hearing all these amazing stories and helping them distill the stories, sometimes unpack them for the first time in public, like my friend Tony Riddle, who came on my podcast. It was like the first time he shared his story on my podcast. And now he's gone off and done some amazing things. He's got, you know, thousands, thousands of followers on Instagram. He's got a book deal with Penguin. He was on the Rich Roll podcast and so forth. But a lot of them didn't see the power of their story or they didn't think that their story mattered. I'm like, that was so inspiring or so interesting or so valuable. And then on the second part, I would get messages and DMs from people listening to the show telling me, I really enjoyed that episode. I really resonated with that part of their story or I've bought their product, I've bought their book, I'm joining that. And it kind of like made me think, I thought, well, we've got this thing called like our story, but so many of us just A, don't see it or, and B, don't use it, don't leverage it, don't share it. Why is that? So I became fascinated by that idea and researching about that, talking with people about it. As you know, you and I met, I, you know, I teach and I'm a mentor in the, the KPI program as the profile mentor. So I, I help people how to raise their profile, put themselves out there. And so I would ask all the time, like, why, why aren't you sharing your story? And so I collected all that data and that information and I came up in my book, I talk about this, like the 10 story blockers, right? The 10 reasons why people don't share their story, whether I don't feel confident or I, I'm afraid of what will happen if I share it. Like all these kind of different excuses, reasons or challenges or obstacles that get in your way. I listed them in the book and trying to hopefully share like what are they and what you can do about it, right? Um, and then what was fascinating to see was example of, of business leaders in different industries who'd managed to own their story and share the story in a really compelling way that enabled them to attract some top talent despite them maybe having a smaller budget than their competitors, enabled them to build like a tribe of raving fans who just wanted to brag about their products and services. So it just enabled people to punch above their weight. So I was just like, why aren't people doing this? Well, like, why aren't more people doing it? And so that's why I decided to write the book, Glow in the Dark. I really wanted to to help people see that 
Your story holds the emotional glue that your audience have been waiting for. It gives them a reason to know, like, and trust you more. It gives them an ability to connect with why you do what you do and not just see you as like just another kind of a company or a brand that's just in it for just the money because you've got a vetted interest in seeing their results and seeing them win. Um, and it just enables people to be feeling part of an exciting story when you share like what you're about, where you come from, but also where you're going. Um, so that's a long, long answer to, <laughs> to your question, yeah. but hopefully that, that gives you some context. Do you, do you think anyone can do this? Because there's, 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 you know, there's kind of really inspiring stories and there's, there's quite heartbreaking stories sometimes, mm -hmm. but they can still tie it in with what they do or how they've got to where they are. But do you think sometimes they're just they're, there's just a lack of story there, or do you think anyone can pull a story out of where they've come from? Wholeheartedly believe everyone can. Like you know, I've yet to meet someone who I haven't worked with who hasn't been part of my. You know, I run a an online coaching accelerator program called Own Your Story, which are for CEOs and founders, right? Entrepreneurs trying to understand like how does my story connect the dots as to why I do what I do and how can I get it out there so people get excited, I get invited at speaking opportunities, you know, booked on podcasts, that kind of stuff. And I can tell you, you know, a lot of people come and like, I'm not sure there's anything there. Like, and the moment you start scratching beneath the surface, you start finding treasures, you know, it's a little bit like an archaeologist and you go off in, you know, ancient Egypt and you don't know where maybe they lie, but if you keep enough digging, you'll find something. And it's a little bit like that. I think one of the story blockers actually um, I don't know if you read the book or not, but if 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 you read it, you'll you'll, you'll remember that there's a story blocker that's something about the along the lines of, but I don't have a Hollywood story, so what's the point of me sharing it? Well, there's a couple of things. One of them is, you know, you you probably suffer from you know one of the biggest challenges, which is proximity bias, which is you're too close to your own story to see the value that it can have for your business, for the audience, and for yourself. And I can talk to you that in a second. What I think like the three like benefits of sharing your story. Um, that I really believe in. But ultimately, it's not about how traumatic your life story was. Because some people, they haven't at least perceived like this big T trauma or even like a small T trauma in their lives. And so they think that they've got no place to share their story, that their story can't move an audience to action. But that's not true. Like often it's, it's seemingly small things that we've just, for some reason, ignored or labeled as something that's irrelevant or doesn't make sense but often it's like that piece of the puzzle that we've been looking for um and and look it's it's i think it's one of my superpowers to try to find the universal message in everyone's story because ultimately that's what i believe in it's like your story is about you but it's not for you so if you look at it from a perspective of like i'm sharing my story not because i want the world to see me like me and validate me but rather like i think there's something in this that's valuable for someone out there who needs to hear it. like i wished i'd heard this when i was going through that or i can see why i do what i do now today you know like even you know as as i've been doing a whole bunch of interviews and i've really been appreciated the podcast it kind of helps me unpack a lot of the the messages but one of them is you know when i think about what i do so i my kind of main gig is I'm a speaker, right? So I go into companies or I go at conferences and I get to talk on stage and get paid really well to do that. And uh, and I think about like, oh, when when did that start? Like why, you know, if I go back to my story, well, I can actually pinpoint that moment. You know, I'm three and a half, four years old. Um, I'm at this school play, like nursery end of year school play, you know, like, you got kids, anybody listening who's got kids will know this. Like end of the year, you get to go and see your kids perform. And it's actually really cool as a parent. You can see your kid there and they're doing all that their, their jazz. So I was <laughs> I was cast as like a dragon. And I wasn't like the knight in shining armor. And for whatever reason, this is we're talking about 19 in the 1980s, right? Um, my role was to go and capture this this damsel in distress or this princess, capture and put her like in my cave, and then this kid would come out with a sword and slay me and then you would save the princess right that was like i think i guess that was kind of like what the teacher had in mind except what happened is that when i was going around and people were laughing kind of i was being like the city dragon the knight comes out and like stabs me and i i do like this really dramatic death right and everybody starts laughing like i just remember, i still remember to this day parents are laughing and i'm on the floor and i look up and i'm like oh wow like I can do something and create an emotional impact and response in other people so i get back up and i 
and everyone's kind of like laughing because like what is he doing this kid the teacher's kind of like what this is wait she's looking at a script this is not part of it and i'm running around and the poor this poor kid's trying to kill me again and i do it again right like i do this big dramatic death and again big laughs because everyone's going like what the hell is this kid my mom's probably embarrassed to death and i do this maybe two three times until the teacher comes and drags me off stage and people are clapping but I, I think if I had to look back at that moment, and I didn't really realize this until I kind of did the exercise I talk about in my book, that's the moment I realized that I, I had an opportunity to make people feel a certain way by the way I show up on stage. And then I was really fortunate and lucky that my mom was a school teacher for 35 years plus. And so she used to put up these school plays for kids because we were, grew up in France, right? And so she was, she was teaching literature and language. And she would put up these plays so the kids could experience drama and theater and all this kind of stuff. But obviously, as a young kid, she had to do something with me. So instead of, you know, figuring out, putting me in the car, which was even probably still illegal, she wouldn't have done that, but she got me in the play. So I was like a bush at the back of like West Side Story. I was like a dancer or a puppet in Bugsy Malone or whatever. And so I grew on stage, really. And, and, and I was, I'm dyslexic. I'm a dyslexic thinker and proud of it. And as such, I really struggled to read out loud, which is why my audiobook was a total nightmare to do. So for those of you listening, if you buy my audiobook, I, I love and appreciate you. I know that it was really tough. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I struggled to read out loud. I struggled to write, struggled to do maths. So I was bullied as a kid by not my peers, but my teachers, right? I was humiliated almost on a daily, if not weekly basis. And so I had that stigma in my mind that I'm stupid, I'm unworthy, I'm dumb, I'm unlovable. But when I went on stage, it was a completely different ball game. There I shined. There I was at home. So ever since I was a kid, I can see how the stage was my second home. And I can see why I do what I do today. Because when I was in that classroom feeling dumb, inadequate, unlovable, whatever the words I could use, I know what it feels like for someone to feel like they're not being seen, heard, or loved. And the work I do whether that's through Own Your Story, my coaching program, whether it's through the talks I give at corporates and conferences, it's always the same thing. It's like, I want to help you be seen so you can see that there's nothing wrong with you, that you struggle just like as any other human being, that you've got all these limiting beliefs and self-doubts that we all go through, especially if you're in trying to build something, especially if you've got a mission that you believe in, if you've got a message you want to share with the world. So I'm just trying to help a little bit, like be a little bit of a chilean in the back corner, but also saying, hey, you're not alone. I see you. I get you, and we're gonna get you over the line. Um, again, don't ask me questions about it. I just, I just go off on about twenty-minute tantrums. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I love that. You, you talk. See, I, I listen to you telling stories like this, and it just it flows so well. And you seem to be able to tie it in with things really well. But do, do, do sometimes people you're working with do they struggle to tie their story if they can? pull a story from their past, do they struggle to tie their story no, with I mean, I, what again, they do? I mean, again, I'd be honest if I told you. I, again, I have yet I have yet to meet someone who we can't look and unpack their story, take the time and kind of see why they do what they do. It, 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 it's almost like, I'm, I'm not going to say unthinkable because maybe, you know, I'm sure that some people just start businesses just because, but even then, if you scratch me to the surface, you'd probably figure out something that happened early on. Like, I've, you know, I used to work a lot with, CEOs and, and and founders, right, of six to seven figure businesses. And um and we would unpack their story and we'd go through that and eventually we'd we'd come across this like light bulb moment or we'd connect the dot and it's like, oh my, that's this is of course this is why I do what I do. And it might not always be obvious, right? So it is a skill to kind of find that connection. But I just want to speak to what you just said. It's like, you know, yeah, it sounds like I'm just comfortable sharing stories and you know, that I'm a natural storyteller, what have you. But actually, it wasn't always the case. And and I think what most people confuse is they see hard work. You know, you and I were talking offline before this about our, our health and fitness journey, right? And uh, I'm in right in the middle right now as you're interviewing me, like going through this kind of body transformation, health, trans whatever you want to call it, just a reset, you know, dad of two young kids, approaching 40s, <laughs> you know, midlife crisis. So... I'm going through this process and I had such a limiting belief and a story used to tell myself that I can't build muscle. I was, I was born and like I grew up skinny as hell. And then I went completely the other side. I put on a bunch of weight. Right. And so I've just been comfortably in a dad bod overweight for a while. 
And I just said this story that I, I can't build muscle. And when I saw people who were, you know, and you and I, I mean, I'm a white belt in prison jiu-jitsu, so I'm not even going to try and compare myself to you, but we, we geek out about, you know, BJJ and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'd go, I'd go and roll with guys and they're like in incredible shape. And I'd look at them like, oh, they're just naturally gifted. It's in their DNA. Like I look at my dad who, you know, is overweight. Um, I look at my grandparents, like, you know, there's, there's a pattern in my head. I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't do that. That's a story, right? That I have myself. But since I've started this journey, and there's a point to this, by the way, since I've started this journey, what I've realized is, oh, there's no secret. It's just hard work. If I show up consistently three times a week at the gym, lift some weights, if I go running at least once a week, basically swimming, biking, whatever, if I cut out booze, if I eat pretty clean, like 80% of the time, results are going to happen. And my body's completely changing like completely changing, right? Like I'm transforming before my eyes and looking at myself in the mirror. I sent a picture to one of my best mates in America, Dennis. I think I talk about him in the book about Flowers for Africa, the the, the chapter on that. Um, I sent this picture and I'm looking at this picture and it, it doesn't feel real that it's me because I feel like it was obviously after like a big, heavy kind of weightlifting upper body pump kind of thing. So I looked like almost jacked, but I looked at it. I was just like, oh, that's me. But that's because I've been in the hard work. I, I I had the gift in 2008, I think it was. I used to hang out with stand-up comedians in South Africa, including Trevor Noah. And uh, I used to hang out with them. We used to do like brais, which are like barbecues basically in South Africa. We used to hang out and I'd go and see their shows. And, and what I saw was that, oh, they would do like the same set, sometimes twice in the same evening at different gigs over and over and over again until, until they got really good. And so what people don't realize is that it sharpens as you share. But because we have this, this fear of gap between where we see where we would like to be or we compare ourselves to others who are like already a bit further down the road of having practice, putting their laps and putting the time, putting the work, that we judge and that we, we, we are terrified of, of finding out will we ever be able to get to this level or, or are we just going to be mediocre for the rest of our lives. And so most of us don't start. But what I do on the program is I get people to slowly but surely start unpacking their story, start owning it and start sharing it in comfortable, safe situations, whether that's within the community of our group or start putting it a little bit out there. And what you see is there's a difference between the first time you share your story and the 10th and the 20th and the 100th time that you share your story. And eventually you then become like Scott Harrison, who I think is one of, you know, one of the masters of using and leveraging his personal background story, his origin story as a way to contextualize why he started Charity Water. And, you know, we're talking about someone who used who openly talks about how he used to be in the nightclub scene of New York and had an obscene lifestyle of, you know, drugs and alcohol and sex and addicted to pretty much anything you could imagine. Going from that to suddenly creating this charity to, to raise all this money to provide clean water for people who need it most. And that for me is like a beautiful reminder of a lot of us walk around with these warts and these wounds and these things that we're ashamed of or we feel guilty about. And we're often really afraid of bringing that into our work. And I'm not saying that your work is therapy, right? Like, again, I talk about the book, the different types of stories like open wounds, et cetera. But I do think that if you take, again, the success of stand-up comedians and you bring it to the business world, one thing that I've noticed is, you know, being yourself is good for business. I think bring a little bit more humanity into your work, bring a little bit more, less of a robot. You know, I was listening to a podcast recently. They were telling about why they think people have just lost interest in politics. And um, it was Sadiq Khan. Yeah, it was, it was the mayor of London, actually, um, who was being interviewed by Stephen um, Bartlett on the Diary of the CEO. And I thought it was really interesting because he was asking like these really great questions. And he basically said, I'm not going to answer that because if I answer that, my, my opposition are going to use it against me. And I had this debate about but there's a problem, like politicians by nature really struggle with being real or authentic. But then once in a while you get one that comes out, is left field and love them or hate them, they often attract and galvanize this huge, like crazy following because it's fresh, it's different. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking I'm an accountant or I run an agency or I can't really bring myself to work, like I challenge you. You know, whether that's at your next team meeting, whether that's an offsite, whether that's talking to a client, whether that's speaking on a panel at a school, on a podcast, the media, pitching. There are 
countless opportunities where you can bring people in a little bit more into why you do what you do and why it matters. I think like I'm actually going and delivering the closing keynote um, at a at a really famous French business school, HSC, in, in March. They're bringing 150 entrepreneurs to London and I'm, and I'm going to be chatting there about like the power of story and, and pitching, right? Because they're going to be pitching like a little pitch fest kind of thing. And, um, and it's just making it stick if you want to make it stick you got to connect and the way you connect is 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 through the heart and through the story and i think it's mad and crazy that we all have this superpower that that we're just putting in a cupboard and not leveraging yeah like 100 because because i hate to say this but everybody can copy your products and services no matter how great you think your products or services are no matter how great you think your branding is the only thing that people can't copy is your story that's it like nobody can copy origin story. In fact, a lot of people talk about chat TDP and, you know, AI and taking over our creative jobs and all this stuff. And look, I, we could have a conversation separately about that. I think there's some great things about that. And I think there's going to be like everything, a time of adaptation. But one thing that AI can't do is authenticity to a level of which we as humans possess the greatest tool. And I think that is embedded greatly in part in our stories. Agreed. If um, you, you mentioned like an accountant or a founder, mm. um, if someone's like like that is sitting listening and thinking, okay, where do I start? Mm. Like, I don't really feel like I've got a story. Mm. I don't think I've got anything interesting. Where mm-hmm. where do I start? How do I unpack that? Well, shy of buying my book and going through the exercise to talk about my book, I'll give you a few nuggets now. <laughs> but so, um, but actually, seriously, my book, I, I broke I, I broke down my book into two parts. Part number one is very much like the psychology of storytelling and personal narratives in a business context. Why it matters, I give case studies, examples, client success. Like it just is jam-packed so that by the end of part one, there's no way you should be leaving that part one going, I'm not really sure that storytelling actually matters. Or I don't really see how my person, like that covers. The part two is how to. So it's, it's, it's kind of, again, jam-packed with like practical tips and exercise on how to do it. So one of them, that I talk about is this concept called, you know, the river of life. And this idea is that you take a moment and you map out your entire life journey from birth to present moment in terms of your highs and your lows, your ups and your downs on your professional and personal uh, side of things, right? And the really important thing is to, to stay curious and to not to think, I don't see how this is relevant to my business, so I'm not going to put it down. No, it's a terrible disaster recipe for missing out a golden nugget that you don't know yet is part of the puzzle, right? So you put down everything, everything down. Highs and lows, best strategy for that is pen and paper, big sheet of paper, put some ambiance background music on, do not put a podcast or whatever it is, don't get interrupted, do that. If you struggle with that exercise, there's another exercise that I find quite helpful for founders, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, and that's the idea of a time machine. So if I could give you a time machine and you could go back in your life at three different moments of your life, And you could give yourself a piece of advice or comforting words or just something that you think you needed at that point of time. What would those moments be and why? And often those are actually really great parts of stories to unpack, whether you get to use them or not is is a different, different kind of story. But once you've done that, once you've kind of gone through the process of unpacking a bunch of stories, it's a little bit like I, I use the metaphor in the book about how as kids, my brother and I used to play with Legos, these kind of orphan pieces of Legos that didn't belong to any set, but just were galvanized by my parents in this big bag. And we used to play with them and build all these kind of weird constructions out of them. And then my nephew and my niece started doing it. And now my kids use the same bag. And it's a little bit like that with your story. It feels like this big mess, but actually when you start putting them together, it starts taking shape and form and you can use them for different structures and different environments and different contexts. So if you're speaking with a client, it might be slightly different than if you're talking at a pa- on a panel or if you're going to speak at a conference or if you're interviewed on a podcast. Like There's just different elements of platforms. I talk about that in the book about the metrics of platform audience message and um, context. But you, you, you can then apply a very simple th- a three-step formula, which I kind of explain in the book. Um, would you like me to, would that be helpful if I broke that? Yeah, if you can, if you can give a brief of that. Yeah, good. the brief of it is, I think for anybody else who's like a fellow geek on storytelling, there's great resources out there. There's some great books, right? Like um, 
The Hero of the Thousand Faces, you know, Joseph Campbell's book, um, you know, Donald Miller's Building Story Brand. Like there's all these great tools to understand storytelling and the arcs and narratives and all this stuff. But often what I found is that they're, you know, seven, nine, 12 steps, whatever it was. Um, and for entrepreneurs, business leaders, thought leaders, game changers, I could, you've got to have something quite quickly. A, a very simple formula that you can apply on the spot and on the fly. And a lot of people think that, oh, you know, I've got all these stories that are, but actually a lot of the times I use a story and I'll put it through the filter I'm about to teach you. And, and it's very simple. It's three C's. Um, number one is is context. So the first C is context. Like give me the context of the story. What's going on? What are you doing? Where are you? What do I need to know just so that my brain isn't busy trying to figure out what's going on here, right? Number two is content. So that's like, what is it that you're actually trying to say? Like, what's the emotional or the resonance or the important story part that you're trying to share? And the third part is conclusion, right? That's like, that's where most people go wrong because most people just tell stories. They're just like the sound of their own voice or they like to be entertaining, but they're not actually valuable or helpful. But if you're using it in a business or professional context and you want to advance your mission, your message, your movement, whatever it is, then you need to make sure that you go to third part, which is conclusion, which is what's the point of your story? What's the message? Like, don't, don't try and get your audience to guess what you're trying to say. Just explicitly say it. So it's kind of like, take me, uh, tell me, teach me kind of approach. So, you know, you can apply that to any kind of formula and you start practicing it. And then like a vending machine, you end up with all these different stories that feel a little bit congruent in a way. And depending on which part you're being interviewed or asked a question or you can pick that story and you can bring it in. And what happens eventually is that you start going, oh, actually, this this story is kind of linked to that one and that one. And then before you know it, you've got a kind of a personal narrative and you can adapt it. You can make it short. So sometimes if you're being interviewed on a panel, you've got 30 seconds to introduce yourself. But maybe on a long format podcast, you might have 20 minutes to introduce yourself. So the idea is so you can have a formula or a strategy that enables you to know exactly what you're saying for who you're saying it and why you're saying it, whether that's 30 seconds or 30 minutes. So, so one question I did have on that is, is where you can then use your story or stories. But mm. I guess from what you're saying, it depends on what stories you package together. You might be able to use them on podcasts and um, on stage in panels. Um, yeah. So oh, yeah, I guess it, it very much depends so you, on- you can use it. Basically the thing is, on average, I think HBR came up with an article that said, on average, or at least before pandemic, like you were asked three to seven times by people during a week, like, what do you do? And I think that's that's an opportunity to share your story. Again, it's you've got to think about if you want to become better at enrolling people, if you want to get people, if you want to get better at engaging people and effortlessly attracting like your ideal customers and clients. You've got to get better at telling stories and wrapping up what you do in, in a story format. And I think, you know, I'll give you an example. So um, let's say I'm talking to a company, right? I'm talking with a prospective client who wants to bring me in to go and give a talk at their organization or their conferences or something. And um, instead of telling them like, hey, here's my process. This is what I do. I'll actually tell them a story that contextualizes what I'm actually saying. And at the end of it, they're like, oh, I get it. Right. So I'll, I'll give you an example. When I used to go around and, and talk to companies about um, culture and purpose and how to find meaning and purpose in organizations before I kind of focused more on like storytelling, you know, I used to say, I used to kick off by saying like, my mission in life is to eradicate career misery in the workplace so that I can create organizations and business leaders who, if anything would happen to me, I would know my kids would be taken care of and they could go and work for organizations and leaders that would treat them with respect and humanly the way that I would want them to. Like I would start like that. And so people would then understand where I'm coming from, why I'm doing this, right? Like I'm not just talking, I'm trying to change and transform cultures within organizations so that my kids can go and work there one day and actually be treated with compassion and and, and, and humanity and, and, and fill in the blank, right? Because I've been in really toxic work environments. So it contextualizes what I did, what I do. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I really want to touch on, and I know this is something you don't talk about a huge, huge amount. And you've mm. spoken to Valerie Young, I think it was Dr. Valerie yeah. Young on your podcast about yeah. imposter syndrome. Yeah, and um, I, 
I'm reading, uh, I'm reading this book at the moment. You might recognize it. It's a great book. But, um, <laughs> there, was, there was something in it. You had a list in here. I just want to read a few of them because mm. I, I just think it rings true with probably a lot of people that will listen to this. Mm -hmm. And that's things like, who am I to talk about this? Mm. It's all been said and done. What mm. do I have to add? Mm. There are people far more qualified or able or better than me. Nobody cares about what I have to say. Why bother? Mm. I'll run out of things to say. Nobody cares about my story. So that, and the list goes on as well. And there's, so there's all these blockers yeah. that not only stop us from unpacking and telling a story that we're aware of, but mm. also just, you know, wanting to put ourselves out there. Um, yeah. yeah what, what are your thoughts around the whole imposter syndrome thing and, and battling that? So interestingly, the original book pitch I sold to my publisher was I was going to write a book about helping solve imposter syndrome for entrepreneurs. That was kind of the pitch. And the reason being is that throughout the years of working with entrepreneurs and CEOs and founders, I kind of kept on coming across a very similar pattern. I, I kept on seeing these incredibly talented women and men who had founded something, started something, often growing something with some form of traction, some more than others. They were really good at what they did. They really believed in the product or service that they were providing. Their clients seemed to be happy about it. But they really did not like the idea of having to put themselves out there or talk about their work. And I thought that was kind of crazy, right? It's a little bit like you're a really good restaurant. The food's amazing. Produce, quality, top notch. Guests who come and dine in your restaurant love it. But you don't want to, you don't want to have, you don't want to talk about it. It's, it, it. That would be crazy, right? It'd be crazy because it's almost selfish. Like you're not letting people know that there's an amazing place that they can go and eat and have this great experience just because of your fill in the blank. Insecurity, uh, resentment. Um, you know, if you ask most business entrepreneurs, most would tell you that they wish they had a magic win and the clients just flocked to them and they didn't have to talk about their business and they could just focus on the business, doing, doing the work rather than having to sell the work. But actually, I think there's a, there's a real there's a real lovely communion that can happen between when you start talking passionately about why you do what you do and people resonating and listening to what you have to say, right? And, and one thing that I realized pretty quickly, again, is that when you talk to people about why, you know, they're not putting themselves out there, why they're not raising their profile, why they don't want to build their personal brand, all that kind of stuff. There's a few reasons that come up, but I would say if I had to boil them down and, and to really simplify them, I would say there's something like, I don't want to be the kind of person who's perceived as someone who wants attention. Or I don't want to be the person who says, look, look at me, 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 love me, like me, you know, want me. I want my work to speak for itself. But that's not how the world works. Like, it's a really noisy world out there. We're looking at 4,000 to 8,000 commercial messages each day that we get bombarded with. So customers looking for a solution, it's hard to find like, who should I, who can I trust? Who, who can I trust to help me solve my problem, my challenge? And one way that you can help them find the best solution for them is to talk about the great work that you do, not because you want to be the next Kim Kardashian, but because you want them to know that they're not alone and that there's hope out there and that you've got a solution for them. And if you're a good fit, then you can work with them, right? And it doesn't matter if you're a product or a service-based company, if the, if the same applies. And so one of the paradigm shifts that I think is really helpful um, is, is I used to say, um, make your audience more important than you looking good. Okay. I was like trying to put your attention more on the people you're trying to serve versus the attention that you put on yourself. And then Dan put it even better. He was kind of like, well, you know, it's not about being in the spotlight. It's about becoming the spotlight. And what I love about that paradigm shift is this idea that most people think they need to be in the spotlight in order to be seen, heard, and recognized and build their brand and profile. Well, actually, what I've seen is most efficient, especially when you're looking at the 70 to 75% introverts or ambiverts, at least in the, in the founders and CEO space, is it's really reassuring and freeing to know that it's not about you, but rather it's about the challenge that you're seeing, a problem you want to solve, something in your industry that needs to change, 
just something you want to raise awareness to and that you become a spotlight for that. You shine the light on what people should know and, and why the, they deserve better, why the world should be different. And by doing so, you automatically raise your own profile, which is counterintuitive, but it's very reassuring for people to go, oh my God, like it doesn't have to be about me because your story is about you, but it's not for you. I'm going to say that again. Your story is about you, but it's not for you. That's the difference between a self-centered, self-serving story with a selfless and a really meaningful impact-driven story, whereby I am leveraging my story to land a bigger message. I am using my story to make you feel seen, heard, and understood in some way versus I'm telling my story so I can get a pity party. And, 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 and sometimes we need that and you go to therapy for that, right? Or you can go and see a very trusted, intimate friend for that or a partner you trust. But does that make sense? Like just, just wanted to yeah, clarify, course, like in a yeah. business and professional context setting, the idea is like, let me tell you why I'm passionate about digital marketing. Let me tell you about why I decided to launch this agency to change the way that clients are treated or whatever that is, because we've all experienced something, right? Um, even me, like when I go and give talks, right? When I give talks to companies, I have a very particular process and, and a kind of a signature style of how I deliver my talks and how I prepare for them. And it's based on my experience of having been on the receiving end of a bunch of speakers who come in and have no idea who they're talking to. They've got like this five or seven step formula that they've got off the shelf and they think it's like able to be plastered across everybody and every different industry. And so I said, I'll never do that. Like, I want to go in a room and have a very basic understanding of who's in the room, what kind of challenge they have, how can I support and help them, and then adapt my content to match the desires, the dreams, the fears, the yearnings of the people in the room. I was, um, I was talking to my cousin the other day, and I was saying to him, like, you, to help your business, you, you need to put yourself out there more. He's very quiet online. He's never on video. He's very mm. nervous about the whole thing, but he's not, he's not a nervous person. You know, he's, he's mm. a two times Britain's strongest man uh, under 105 uh, weight class. He, I think mm -hmm. he came eighth in worlds in China or something like that. He then um, injured his back, had to move away from that, but moved into, started training MMA with me, had one amateur mm. fight, won that. You know, he's, he's qualif like qualified, um, well qualified in nutrition and strength and conditioning and so on. Mm. He, he's well qualified to talk about these sorts of things, but mm. you know, he sees all these fitness influencers and think, you know, who are talking about me, 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 and look at me, look at mm. me, the spotlight mm. is, you know, on them. Well, uh, and it's probably a you bit don't, putting, you, I think. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so you don't want to end up. So, but here's what's interesting. I often find that for clients, I need to put blind spots on them. I need to put like those blind, you like horses, like just stay in your lane, focus, because there's always going to be noise. There's only going to be charlatans. There's going to be weirdos in any industry you're going to be in. And if you're scared of being associated to them, you're putting your attention in the wrong place. You know who you are. You know how you show up. You know the integrity you have. Just focus on that and keep 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 driving that message. And also, I, I did um Google asked me to do like a, to become like a mentor. Like they did this thing called Digital Garage, which is like a, I think it's still free, a resource for people to to check. It's like the like the Netflix of business if you want or careers that they did a while back. And I was I was the mentor for a personal branding and, and raising your profile. And uh, and at the beginning, like when we, it was really cool, like they did this proper like set, like um, studio kind of, uh, they set up this uh, film set and I had a lot of makeup on. So if you look at me on, and I look a bit strange, it's because they went a bit harsh on the mascara. But um, uh, <laughs> at the beginning, they kind of said, you know, what are the typical things that people say out loud? that gets in the way of, of them talking about their great work. And it's things like stop being a show off. Um, stop bring, drawing attention to you. And all that's, you got to think about from a cultural perspective, a lot of that stuff is what's been drilled into us. As we grow up, be humble. And some of them are good, right? Like they're not all bad, like values, but like be humble, be discreet, don't brag. And so when it comes down to business, it can feel like either I've got to be some arrogant prick or... I've got to be like this timid, shy, but really believe in my craft and just hope for the best. I think there's, I think there's an alternative, which is um, talk about the results of your clients. You know, like for your, for your friend, I would say, 
if 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 he, I think it, I think you said he. You know, if, I think so. If he struggles with talking about himself, say like, hey, how about you talk about the lives that you've improved or helped through your work, client testimonials, uh, celebrate your spot. And if and if you might say, look, I'm just starting off. I don't have that many clients. Well, then in that case, find stories online that that you find inspiring that you want to share with your community. Like you can curate content online, and that still positions you as someone who's, you know, interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's kind of like you you do that, and then, and then when you feel a bit more comfortable, you might say, "Hey, for those of you who are new and who started following me, let me just rem- like let me give you a little background to who I am." Like Lucy Werner from the Wern PR agency does this really well, and it's like every every quarter maybe she'll just do like a hi, I'm Lucy post on Instagram and she'll kind of reintroduce who she is. So you can use that as an opportunity to maybe share something about you like, um, you know, why why you transitioned to do MMA or, or you know, actually this is, this, is a, this is a tip that any, everyone can do no matter what industry you're in. You can say, what is it that you hate most about your industry? <laughs> or what really pisses you off about like people in industry, right? And you could do a whole like, you know, I don't know, a Freaky Friday kind of, posts where you, you talk about look i saw this ad you might not want to get you know sued by discriminating or d- defaming people but you might just want to say so i'll give an example i'll give an example actually so i'm working right now with like an elite personal trainer like i mean there are levels to personal training and and clearly you know rob mcneil he's big shout out to rob um gamesville so anyway so he you know he he's got like levels right and I've worked with a bunch of other great trainers, but I've also worked with some trainers years and years ago that just weren't that good. And one day I remember I went to like this PT with, I had this PT session at this random gym somewhere and it was such a bad session, right? That I went on a rant on Instagram, <laughs> but it was a semi rant, but also it was like, if you're a PT, here's what you need to know about what actually goes in the mind of your client. So things like while I'm, what I'm, what I'm pushing, like when I'm bench pressing, don't look at your phone and go on Instagram, you know? Like, what are you doing? You, you know, I need, you might need to spot me. Just like all these things, you know, that I was kind of saying. That, in a way, you, you, you could also, like, highlight the do's and don'ts. So, for example, me, right? Imagine if I wanted to do a, a, a talk. I might say something like, I've just got off the phone with a client who told me she had a bit of a horror story with a speaker she just hired. Here's what happened. And so then I, you know, I can tell a story. Then I can say... If you're looking for speakers, here's what you should be asking them before you you send them a check, right? And then give them some tips on how to hire other speakers. It's not because I, you know, but it's this idea of like, if I help you make better decisions, our industry improves. Does that make sense? It's a little bit like your friend, I would say, think about all the way that he would like to make the industry better, what kind of person he wants to be online and just focus on that blind spots on everything else, stick to your lane, focus on the success stories of your clients, get known for the results that you get for whatever style, what you believe in. And then you can start sharing and creating different information, content, you know, whether that's articles or stories or whatever it is. And when you feel a little bit more confident because you've done this for a little bit, then you can say, hey, by the way, here's here's something about me that you might not know. You know, but maybe you could have like a monthly or a weekly post where he might say, a fun fact about me or a, a, you know, a little known fact about me, something like that. And that just creates a little bit of a personal touch. It makes you feel like, oh, you know, for example, so Greg Wooton, right, who I interviewed on my podcast, um, used to be a number one UK Muay Thai fighter, world champion. And um, strangely, it's one of my favorite episodes I did because I think it's, it was so interesting to talk to someone who is in an extremely what you would call like male dominant sport, right? Like, you know, very kind of macho and bravado and look how tough I am and let me like talk down my opponent and just like smashing faces, right? And getting smashed. But he had a real sensitivity to him that was really refreshing. And he talked about body dysmorphia, and about as a fighter, when you weight cut and you're going up and down in weight, how people say, oh, you look a bit chubby and fat. And then they'll be like, man, you look good. You look in shape. And then that, what that creates your relationship to food, how it changes. It, there was such a realness to him that it stood out, right? As like all the other Muay Thai fighters or MMA fighters, like it just, it just stood out. And then if I had to work with a trainer, I would work with him because I felt like he had an ability 
to be real and that I could be real as a result with him. And that would be something I'd be looking for for like a train. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you yeah. kind of, you find ways to connect with your audience in, in whatever shape or form you can. And you get remembered that way as well. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Well, so I'm conscious of time, Mark, but I did want to ask you mm. one last question. And that was Please. just about your podcast. You've, have, what are yeah. you at now? 160 something episodes? Yeah, something like that. Um, <laughs> what's, obviously you haven't listened to all of them, unfortunately, but... Well, I'm all the guests you've had, um, what's yeah. been what's been the biggest lesson or um, the yeah the biggest lesson from a guest and what what lesson was that? Oh, the biggest lesson from a guest. Yeah, the one that's really stuck in your mind that someone someone said to you. I've sprung this on you. So. Well, so so actually, it's weird. It's so weird that this comes up, um, but this is who comes up. So. Um, so let's go with that. Um, I, I, I used to ask all my guests, like, what were like three things that they'd learned about life that they wanted to share? Like something like that. I forgot what it was. I used to use this. I was inspired by Lewis Houses, the uh, School of Greatness podcast. It was kind of like the three lessons you've learned about life that you want to pass on, something like that. And Sam, um, Sam House, who's kind of like a leadership coach, and he trained me through like this leadership program. He's, he's a very wise and and deep man. And, um, I asked him, you know, what are the three things, whatever it is. And I can't remember specifically everything he said, but I remember this one thing he said, love yourself unconditionally, like nothing else mattered. And I've come to believe and think that that is probably the hardest thing, at least for me. And I've seen it in a lot of people and it yet has some of the most potent, um, outcome out of it right because if if and actually it's linked to my to the concept of my book you know glow in the dark which is if you can learn to own your story warts and all and no longer be afraid of what people think of you i think you experience ultimate freedom because you accept yourself fully not about cutting slack for the things you you wish you could have done differently or maybe not have hurt the people you hurt or acted the way you did and none of that but just coming from a place of pure acceptance um and love and and I know it sounds a bit woohoo, but I would say that that out of look and it's difficult because I've, I've so many guests. I but that one came to mind immediately, and I just I, this was years ago. This is 2016, I think, or 2015. That interview and it still still resonates with this idea of like love yourself unconditionally, like nothing else mattered. Uh, that is so hard, and and yet I think it's a valuable pursuit. That's awesome. Love that. And a perfect place to stop as well, I think. Um, <laughs> where can people learn more about you and uh, and obviously buy the book as well? Yeah, so the best place to go and check out for all the book resources, if you want to get the, when you buy the book, you also get an assessment that you can go and do online and and uh, see how much you've transformed from the beginning of the book at the end of the book, which I'm really excited about. So you can go to glowinthedarkbook.com. That's glowinthedarkbook, all attached, .com. And you've got all the information, and all the supplies that supply the book. But you can buy it pretty much anywhere, order it anywhere. Um, and then I'm at Mark LaRue's. That's M-A-R-K-L-E-R-U-S-T-E uh, on LinkedIn primarily. But I'm also hanging a bit on, on Instagram. And if you're listening to this and you made it this far, congrats. Let me know if there's any nuggets that you got away from this conversation. I always love hearing from people listening, especially when you say, hey, I heard you on this podcast or, and here's the one thing I took away because it helps me sharpen my message. It helps me sharpen my story because then I know like what is it that sticks and I can, I can double down on that for the next one. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on, Mark.